When the 19th century dawned, Britain was a land of two nations, a small wealthy class ruling a large and growing population. The Regency was a time between times. It was after absolute monarchy, but it was before democracy. It was towards the end of an age of agriculture. It was the beginning of an age of industry. As radical voices confronted an arrogant elite, the ways of the old order were no longer tenable. It was a time that would set the many against the few. What a wonderful sight for the Regency swells taking part in the new craze for ballooning. This is Bath. Queen City at the West, celebrated for its spa waters, packed full of genteel Jane Austen type characters. But Britain was a troubled land. Years of war had wearied and impoverished the masses. The country hovered on the brink of revolution as the governing classes chose to use violent repression instead of enlightened reform. Challenging Parliament and the Cabinet were a new generation of thinkers and poets and novelists. The power of the word would now take over from the power of the sword, but not without the shedding of blood. In the Regency, people admired a sense of gusto. The most dashing people of the age were literally dashing across the countryside. And the age's favourite vehicle was this monster, the mail coach. The mail coach was extraordinary. It could go at an average speed of seven miles an hour, which seemed utterly amazing to 19th century Jeremy Clarkson's. And this meant that instead of taking two days to get to Cambridge, you could get there in seven hours. Edinburgh was only 60 hours away. Britain was shrinking. Hello there. Are you right there? Right, sign out, please. Today, I'm really excited to travel on the Swingle Tree Mail Coach. We're scorching through the Norfolk countryside. Whoa. This is John Parker holding the reins and Rosie as guard. This coach used to earn its keep on the London to Norwich run. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Back, back, back. by mail coach was expensive, but it was also fast and safe. Our team of horses would be changed every 10 or so miles. We'd be travelling with an armed guard on the back. And when we got to toll gates, they'd open as if by magic. We'd toot our horn and the keeper would leap out of the way because nothing was allowed to hold up the king's mail. So what could you signal with the horn? There's things like, right, I'm so coming, get out of my way. For different coaches, there was different tunes, for even for different people. Yeah. There was their, they had their favourite tunes. OK, so this coach was owned by James Selby, and I think you know his particular coaching call. Let's hear it. If you could afford it, you rode on it. If you couldn't afford this, you tried to hook a ride on something else. If you couldn't get a ride, you had a choice now. You either owned a horse and rode it, or you walked. There's no other choices. Yeah. You couldn't jump on the back of carriages because they put little spikes there to make sure you didn't do it. It's a king's mail. If you held it up, well, you, you died. You either shot or hung, one of the two. That's and a bit if draconian. you stood in front and said, stand and deliver, these teams of horses, they're not going to stop, they're going to flatten you. <laughs> For Regency people, travel by mail coach was like taking Concord. Mail coaches helped them to discover their own countryside. The Highlands and the Lake District and spa towns like Bath became tourist destinations for the first time, thanks to coach travel. 
For the rich, the coach was the only way to travel. The Prince Regent's dirty weekends in Brighton were all horse-drawn affairs. But if George had chosen to notice, the countryside he was travelling through was changing fast. An agricultural revolution was driving the rural workers off the land and into the new industrial cities. The Enclosure Acts denied villagers access to the fields where generations of peasants had scraped out a living. In these troubled times, the labourers of Northamptonshire had a voice through John Clare. He's often called the peasant's poet. In Helpston, his cottage, or cot, still survives. It's now a museum devoted to a rare Regency imagination. And swathy bees about the grass that stops with every bloom they pass and every minute, every hour, keep teasing weeds that wear a flower. Imagine the scene on a dark winter's night. John Clare is sitting on a stool in the corner of the room, writing a poem. His mother over there spinning. This was their cottage. It's just two up, two down. There was earth on the floor, a ladder instead of stairs. And actually 10 people were living here. Three generations of the Clare family shared it. It's not quite our modern idyll of country living by any means, but they were glad to have this cottage. It was their home. Many of John Clare's poems celebrated all things bright and beautiful. But in Helpston, he witnessed the single greatest threat to rural life for over a thousand years, the enclosure of the common lands. Each little tyrant with his little sign shows where man claims earth glows no more divine. But paths to freedom and to childhood dear, a board sticks up to notice, no road here. And birds and trees and flowers without a name, all sighed when lawless law's enclosure came. I talked to the curator David Dykes about the changes Claire lived through. The Enclosure Act of 1809 in this area was the biggest single impact on his life. Prior to that, he was able to walk the fields um, anywhere he wished to go, and he rails against that in the fact he's lost his freedom um, and also lost a livelihood because he couldn't get to the common land, he couldn't uh, graze the cows. His friends were losing their jobs, and it was seen an acceleration of people leaving the countryside. And one of his benefactors, the Fitzwilliam, were the big landowners here, and indeed, they supported Claire during his poetry and also were getting land off him at the same time in, in, during the enclosure process. Claire, through his education, became a curiosity in his native village. The strains of his life and his heavy drinking possibly explained his drift into insanity. And here is a very melancholy letter indeed. Somebody wrote to him at the asylum saying, why no more poems? And this answer is heartbreaking. He writes, Dear Sir, I am in a madhouse. I quite forget your name. He says, You must excuse me, for I have nothing to communicate. I have nothing to say. It's a very sad end for a poet, isn't it? John Clare now lies in the village churchyard. He had asked to be buried round the other side of the church, where there was the most sun in the morning and the evening. This is a man who knew about the weather, don't forget. But in the event, they put him here, near to his parents. In the Regency, when all transport was still horse-drawn, the advantages of the canal for carrying goods were overwhelming. A single horse could pull 50 times more weight on the water than it could on a road. Canals carried coal and iron and grain to the new cities, and then they transported manufactured goods from the factories to the ports. Canals reached their peak with the building of the brilliant Kennison Avon Canal. 
This waterway was the supreme civil engineering achievement of the 1810s. The Regency is often described in terms of fashion and most of all architecture, but the decade should really be remembered as the point when Britain entered the modern machine age. If you ask people to think of Regency architecture, they're probably going to come up with Cheltenham or Brighton or parts of London. But one of the most important buildings from the period is actually here, stuck in the middle of the Wiltshire countryside. You'll work out what it is when you notice the chimney. Steam power would make Britain the most advanced nation on Earth. It drove a technological revolution that would change the face of the country and create social tensions that would threaten to sweep the monarchy away. The Crofton steam engine is still doing its original work of keeping the Kenneton Avon topped up with water. And its engineer today is Harry Willis. So, Harry, what have we got here, then? We've got the oldest working steam beam engine in the world. Is it yours? Well, it's not mine, but I'm certainly responsible for managing it. And what do you need to do to it? Well, these levers control the passage of steam through the engine, and yeah. you need to, uh, to use them when you're starting and stopping it, and also during the, the running of it. So this is the nerve centre. This, this is, is the where the person center. in control stands. We, we call this the driving platform. The drive can I drive? You certainly can, but you'll need to put a boiler suit on first. OK, I'm going to get kitted up like right. you. Here I am, ready to drive. Right. What needs doing? Shall we slow it down, you speed can, it up? You can, you, can put, you can close that a little bit, move it to the left a little bit. So I'm, I'm reducing the reducing the reducing steam, the steam reducing yeah. the steam. That's right. It's hard to imagine how impressive this must have been to someone who hadn't seen machinery before. Exactly, and the impact on the local inhabitants as well, who will have not have only seen horse-drawn transport. And this yeah. this thing came here, began to belt smoke and make noises. You can hear it from mm. some distance you away, can. can't you? Going throb, throb, you throb. You can. In fact, a half is quite a good analogy, uh, isn't it? That's because right. It was keeping the blood of Britain, the canal, flowing. Exactly. exactly. Just, just give it a bit more to the right. A bit more steam to, to the, the right. right. Yep. Or else it will stop. Come on, give it some welly. That's it. It's OK. That's it. And um, there is a, a tremendous amount of power here. Yeah. That's uh, in your hands. Ooh. Ooh. I just Water. want to go faster and faster. <laughs> The Crofton Deem engine lifts 11 tonnes of water up to the canal every minute. There had been water wheels and windmills before, but in the Regency, super-efficient steam engines produced power unimaginable to previous ages. For the first time, you could generate power wherever you had coal for the furnace and water for the boiler. The steam engine liberated and multiplied all that was possible. In the 1810s, this bolted and watt beam engine was at the forefront of technological achievement. The first wonder of the new industrial age. Steam power is one of history's great leaps forward. Manufacturing is taken out of people's houses, brought into factories. So we get a concentration of machinery, of manpower, of the population itself. We get the birth of our industrial cities. The Industrial Revolution of the Regent's time was one of the great discontinuities of history, where everything after was so little like what had gone before. I spoke to the industrial historian Neil Cossons on how it affected those who witnessed these changes. What do you think it felt like to live through this period of enormous change? There is no question in my mind that people through the Regency period knew that they were living in tempestuous times. You only have to dig a little below the surface, I think, uh, and go into these new industrial communities to see both sides of the coin, immense prosperity and huge social deprivation. On the other hand, it's worth remembering that the numbers of jobs that were created as a result of industrialization were huge. So whereas small numbers of cottage-based uh, industries uh, went into decline, 
They were replaced by huge numbers of jobs and mass migrations from the countryside into the new industrial communities. Neil, let's have a look at your favourite picture, I understand. This is, this is certainly one of my favourites, largely because I, I, I lived perhaps 200 yards from where the artist must have stood when he painted it. Yeah. And that's a view looking down the valley of the River Severn with bedlam furnaces and the silhouette of the dwellings and the associated buildings uh, in front of it. And this is a uh, scene painter's, a theatre painter's view, Philippe de Luchterborg's picture of Colbert Dale by Night. He's made it look awe-inspiring and wonderful and sort of magical, though, hasn't he? Uh, a sort of Dante's Inferno view, too. So he's saying, look, isn't it great? Look at all this power and strength and magnificence, do you uh, absolutely. think? Absolutely. And I, that's one of the archetypal images of the middle industrial revolution. But there is, I think, also a statement of an entirely new world. Mm -hmm. And Turner, similarly, and his view of Leeds. Yeah. Now, that painting shows an urban scene which would have been impossible 20 years earlier because you see large factories and chimneys, which would be the chimneys of the steam engines that powered the machines in those factories. And that would have been an entirely new vision and uniquely English, or shall we say British, at that period. I like the way you've got the contrast of the dark satanic mills in the background, and then you've got almost a rural scene here. You've got people going about their business, building a wall, going on a journey on donkeys. But there, they're doing something to do with the textile industry, aren't they? Are they, are they drying, bleaching, colouring cloths? They might be doing any of those things. Okay. <laughs> but, the, but, but, the, but the interesting aspect of that is that you have in parallel the pre-industrial world Still going and the on. new industrial world. Mm. And that's so a there were rural scenes and uh, rural communities that were hardly touched by the impact of industrialization. And one of the things that w we need to remember is that we've, we've been taught more about the evils of industrialization than the, than the, the good the, bits, than the good bits yeah. of it yeah. uh, for generations. And what the Industrial Revolution has hidden, in a sense, partly because it was so all-embracing, is the appalling working and living conditions of the pre-industrial rural poor. Mm. Um, and the squalor and uh, extraordinary deprivation and grindingness of the poverty of the rural labourer um, was at least as bad and possibly much worse than the mill worker of a, year, a generation or two generations later. Textile mills gave many jobs to the men, women and children driven off the countryside in ever greater numbers during the decade. But mechanisation came at a high human cost when each fresh invention or new machine could wipe out a family's livelihood at a stroke. In the Prince Regent's lifetime, spinning was revolutionised. It went from being a case of one person operating one spinning wheel and producing just one spindle of thread to machines like this. This one's got 714 spindles still operated by just one worker, but it means that 713 spinners have lost their jobs. Many people reacted with fear and then with anger. In the 1810s, gangs started to roam about the Midlands and the North, smashing up the new machines, much to the fury of the Tory government. These men were called frame breakers, or more commonly, Luddites. Although Luddism was a grassroots movement, it had an aristocratic supporter in the person of Lord Byron. In 1812, Lord Byron got really upset by the plight of the Nottinghamshire weavers. Some of them were Luddites. And they fell foul of this new bill that was being introduced by the Tories called the Frame Breaking Bill. Anybody caught breaking or damaging machinery would now face the death penalty. Byron thought this was outrageously repressive, and he travelled south to London by coach to plead the cause of the weavers in his maiden speech in the House of Lords. Byron arrived and launched into this passionate speech, defending the Luddites, perhaps even went a bit over the top, and he was arguing against the death penalty for breaking machines. 
He said, yes, the Luddites had committed outrages, but that this had arisen from circumstances of the most unparalleled distress. He was shaking and trembling with emotion. He said that the Luddites had not been ashamed to beg, but there had been no one to relieve them. He said that their excesses, however to be deplored and condemned, could hardly be subject to surprise. Now, did Byron get what he wanted? No, he didn't. This pouting and posturing had slightly annoyed the other lords. And as soon as Byron sat down, they passed their bill anyway. But Byron was suddenly to become a literary superstar when his narrative poem called Child Harold's Pilgrimage was published the following month. The first edition sold out in three days and London was intoxicated. There was traffic chaos because of all the carriages queuing up to drop off dinner invitations at his rooms in St. James's. It was a real overnight success. In Byron's own words, I awoke one morning and found myself famous. Child Harold's pilgrimage gave a warlocked nation a tantalizing glimpse of Mediterranean Europe. It also marked an early stage in Byron's management of his own mysterious, exotic, rakish image. It was an image that consciously played up his theatrical and seductive character, one not bound by social conventions, one who flirted with the dangerous frontiers of the acceptable. In a very modern way, Byron maintained strict picture approval. He rejected one innocent boyish portrait, but he authorised another very camp canvas of himself in full Albanian costume. But Byron's image didn't always match up with Byron in the flesh. I went to the London wine merchants, Berry Brothers, to see some documentary evidence that Lord Byron was not always the snake-hipped seducer of legend. Now in here, I think we've got Lord Byron. There he is. He was first weighed in 1806. He was 18 years old and he was only five foot eight inches tall. He comes in at a pretty hefty 13 stone 12. That was wearing his boots, but not his hat. Now that's borderline obese for a teenager. He wasn't always the irresistible Adonis of legend. And we know he took a lot of trouble to try to reduce his weight. We hear about him playing cricket, wearing seven waistcoats and a great coat in an attempt to sweat it off. And sometimes at dinner, he would refuse all food except for soda water and biscuits. This worked five years later, by 1811. He's lost four stones. He's gone right down to nine stone 11. Pretty svelte. I think I'll give it a go myself. Ooh. That just about balances, but I'm not telling you how much weight there is on the other side. Being a dissolute poet was scandalous enough, but the behaviour of the bloated Prince Regent was truly shocking to his subjects. His affairs with his mistresses outraged the God-fearing, respectable populace. George was a serial adulterer in a way that really opened up to enormous ridicule. Ironically, the one woman who was free from his sexual attentions was his wife. Caroline of Brunswick was his German mail-order bride, and when she arrived in London, George famously said on seeing her, Harris, I am not well, pray bring me brandy. And she said, he wasn't that fat in his portrait. Their wedding was a disaster. He'd only agreed to it to help clear his debts. He complained about her offensive smell and he was drunk at the ceremony. They did manage to produce an heir, but after the honeymoon, they were never intimate again. George was largely indifferent to his only child and heir, Charlotte, and chose not to see her very often, much preferring the company of one of his many mistresses. His selfish and extravagant lifestyle had become a national disgrace. Maybe George's debauched behaviour annoyed the gods, provoking them to send destruction. In April 1815, a volcano erupted far away in Indonesia. It had a dramatic effect on the world's weather and the political climate. 
tongues of flame leaped high into the sky. Explosions ripped the air and smoke and ash swirled high above the Java Sea. Beneath the volcano, over 70,000 perished. It seemed like the end of the world. Mount Tambora's eruption was the largest in recorded history. The explosion was heard over 1,200 miles away. 160 cubic kilometres of debris were thrown into the atmosphere, creating a volcanic winter which lasted the whole of the next year. In Europe, crops would fail, livestock die, and people starve. But the fires and shadows of Tambora had the most surprising effect on the imagination of one young woman. One of the greatest literary creations of the Regency period was Frankenstein by Mary Godwin. She was first the mistress and later the wife of the notorious Percy Bysshe Shelley. The original manuscript is here at the Bodleian. Normally only scholars get to see it. This priceless manuscript is kept safe in Oxford, high up in the tower at the Bodleian Library. There I'm going to meet the writer Daisy Hay, an expert on Mary Shelley. And she can tell me about Mary's curious Swiss holiday. A holiday that gave form to one of fiction's enduring creations. Daisy, hello. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. What have we got, what have we got, what have we got? We've got the manuscript of Frankenstein and some pictures of... Mary and Byram and Shelley. OK. So tell me about this holiday on the banks of Lake Geneva. Well, what happens is that in the spring of 1816, Byron leaves England for good and heads down the Rhine Valley to Geneva. London has become too hot to hold him. And he is joined there, kind of by accident, by Shelley and by Shelley's mistress, Mary Godwin, and by Mary's stepsister, Claire Claremont. This is a really complicated situation. So we've got the two romantic poets and we've got the two sisters and the second sister is kind of stalking Byron. The second well. sister has decided by this point, Claire, that she wants a radical poet of her own. And she writes to Byron and offers herself to him, an offer which he accepts. And this results in a very brief affair just before Byron leaves London. And thereafter, Claire persuades Shelley and Mary that they should follow Baron to Geneva. So they all meet on the shores of Lake Geneva in the summer of 1816, having arrived by different ways. And Baron takes a large villa, a grand house on the shores of Lake Geneva called the Villa Diodati. And it rains a lot. The weather is an important part of the story, isn't it? Yes, the weather turns. Initially it's very beautiful, but then it turns and thunder echoes around the lake. There are huge lightning storms. And the group retreat inside to tell ghost stories and to read Coleridge. The weather's bad all over the world, isn't it? Because of the volcano exploding. Yes, so right across the northern hemisphere really, crops fail and the sun disappears and there's terrible you know, distress in which they will come back to in England in 1816. So what they are experiencing is part of a much wider phenomenon. So they're all cooped up together, they're telling ghost stories and Mary's turns out to be the best of the lot, isn't it? It does, but initially it doesn't happen easily for her. Everybody else gets on with their ghost stories quite quickly and she can't think of one. Until one night she has a nightmare, she calls it a waking dream, and this vision of the moment in which her monster, of Frankenstein, is created, comes to her. And then she's able to say, I have thought of a story the following morning. And here's the actual moment in her own handwriting. This is great. This is the moment that the monster comes to life and the narrator says in the glimmer of the half extinguished light I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open mm. <laughs> and then down here um Shelley her future husband he's annotated it he's improved the writing do you think he's improved it well throughout you can see Shelley's annotations in the margin of the manuscript so you can see the difference between Shelley's handwriting and Mary's and he, what he did is he edited the manuscript as she went along. So you can see that he's changed, for example, handsome for beautiful and has added a description of the hair here as lustrous black. Lustrous black. What's the significance of Shelley changing it? What, what do you think he was adding to the, to the story there? Well, something about lustrous black is he's, he's sharpening the contrast, I think, isn't he? We've got this creature described in terms of colour. We've got yellow and now, and there's something 
almost unearthly about the, the, viv the vividness of this, I think. And uh, the change to beautiful rather than handsome, it's somehow something less, something more inhuman about it, I think. What was the atmosphere like at the villa? Because Byron was definitely the most successful of them yeah. so far, wasn't he? Was it like a rock star with his groupies? Well, I think, as you say, he was the most famous. He's older, he's richer, he's an established poet. But I think that perhaps what the atmosphere is like, it always seems to me to be quite like those kind of conversations you have late into the night when you're a student. They are all very young. Did you practice free love late in the night when you were a student? Uh, no. <laughs> but you know when you argue about things and you stay up till three in the morning, and that seems to be, to be, to be quite familiar, to what they're talking about. The way, that, the way they are to each other, it's that very intense way you are when you're young and you're working out what you think about the world. Here's another bit of Shelley inserting his views. What does that one say? So this is a section with quite a long bit of Shelley annotation. It starts here and then goes over the page. And this is where he's talking about the virtues of a republican system rather than a, a system of, with, with monarchies and talking about this in terms of how you treat those who are more vulnerable than you and about, particularly about the servant classes and about how the system of having servants in Switzerland, which is a republican country, is preferable to that in England. So he's saying, the republican institutions of our country have produced simpler and happier manners than those which prevail in the great monarchies that surround it. So this is a, yeah, a, a, a Shelleyan manifesto, I suppose, sneaking its way into Frankenstein. And Shelley isn't alone, is he, in this decade, the 1810s? There's a lot of people, respectable people, talking up against absolute monarchy. There really is. And for people like Shelley and those around him, the way in which power is concentrated in the hands of a tiny minority just seems to become untenable. So Shelley writes a proposal for putting reform to the vote. He wants there to be a, a referendum on universal manhood suffrage. Um, and so there is a, a feeling that the, the way in which British society is structured cannot go on. In 1816, Britain's small ruling elite were facing their own nightmare. A population suffering unemployment and starvation demanded reform. The pressure from the new urban masses was every bit as terrifying to the government as Frankenstein's monster. The vote in Regency England was limited to a ridiculously small number. Lots of MPs were returned by so-called pocket or rotten boroughs. Dunwich had all but disappeared into the North Sea, and the medieval settlement of Old Serum had only 15 voters, yet both returned two MPs, while the bustling cities of Birmingham and Liverpool and Manchester had no MPs at all. The clamour for fairer parliamentary representation was becoming louder and more insistent. <laughs> The Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool, and his cabinet seemed deaf to the demands of the growing urban population. In 1816, the tension between the two boiled over when a gathering of leading radicals addressed a mass meeting at Spa Fields in North London. Here are the two perpetrators or ringleaders. One of them is Henry Hunt, Henry Orator Hunt, as he's called. He's quite a classy individual. He's 43 years old. He's a prosperous farmer. And what he wants is universal suffrage. He wants an annual election to Parliament. He wants quite a gentle version of reform, I suppose. The great advantage he has as a radical leader is his voice. He has a great pair of lungs. He can address an enormous crowd. And in 1816, he'd been all over Britain addressing these huge gatherings of reformers. He'd spoken to 80,000 people in Birmingham. In Blackburn, 40,000 had turned up to hear him. In Nottingham, it was 20,000. In Stockport, it was 20,000 again. And in Macclesfield, 10,000 people. So he was a very, very popular speaker. The other ringleader was Arthur Thistlewood. He's a very different cup of tea. He's a little bit older, he's 46. He's not a farmer, he's the illegitimate son of one though. And this should set off alarm bells with the authorities. He spent time in revolutionary France. Maybe he's taken in some Jacobin ideas. In fact, he has. He's from a group called the Spencian Philanthropists, and what he wants is violent revolution, followed by the total redistribution of property. 
So in November 1816, a great crowd gathers at Sparfields and they demand reform. They draw up a list of things they want. They want universal suffrage. They want annual elections. This is sent to the Prince Regent, but there is no reply. He completely ignores them. So a month later, in December, the crowd gathers again at Sparfields and this time there's fighting. It's a riot. Arthur Thistlewood is arrested, but he escapes imprisonment. He gets off on a technicality. After Sparfields, the roads of these two men diverge. One peaceful, the other increasingly violent. Thistlewood was now even more determined to incite the London mob into bloody revolution. The regent, who'd loftily ignored the petitions of his people, was now to feel their wrath at first hand. By 1817, those voices of discontent were growing louder. In January of that year, the Prince Regent was in his coach on the way home from Parliament, where he'd been making an address, when he got surrounded by an angry mob. They were shouting, seize him, seize him, and throw things, throw things, and they called him names which were too rude to be printed in the Times. Suddenly there was a loud crack. The glass of the window got broken. George thought that this was an assassination attempt. He offered a thousand pound reward for the catching of the criminal. But then people started asking questions. Nobody had actually seen a gun and nobody had smelt any smoke. Maybe it was all in his imagination. And this turned out to be the case. The thing that broke the window wasn't a bullet at all. It was just an ordinary little pebble. The regent at 55 was underemployed, overdrawn and overweight. He was a laughing stock. In a society jaded by George's excesses, his subjects wished to see in his daughter Charlotte a purer image of royalty. A princess untainted by the gluttony and sexual incontinence of the regent. Aged 20 with great celebration, she married a German prince, Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, and settled here at Claremont House in Surrey. As a child, Princess Charlotte was neglected by her father, but here she found contentment and happiness. And in 1817, Britain was delighted with the news that she got pregnant. Perhaps an heir would provide a brighter future for the Hanoverian dynasty, which her father brought into such disrepute. But it wasn't going to end happily. After a 48-hour labour up there, poor Charlotte's son was born dead and she died a few hours later. In this one dreadful night, the whole royal line of the Prince Regent ended. People said it was as though every household had lost a favourite child. The whole country mourned and drapers sold out of black cloth. On hearing the news, her mother, Princess Caroline, fainted with shock. George, who'd always been a dreadful father, was crippled with grief and unable to face his own daughter's funeral. She was buried, her son at her feet, in St George's Chapel at Windsor. After Charlotte's death, a public subscription was launched to build a monument to honour her. The response was phenomenal. In two years, over £12,000 had been raised and the sculptor Matthew Coates Wyatt was commissioned to make this cenotaph. It must be one of the most spectacular works of art of the Regency. Down below Charlotte's body and the mourners are heavily, realistically draped with cloth. And up above, the angels are carrying Charlotte and her baby up to heaven. There's no sense of British reserve or stiff upper lip here, and rightly so, because the monument was paid for by thousands of ordinary people who wanted a record of their grief. To them, Charlotte had been the future of the monarchy, the future of Britain, and here she is, tragically young, being carried away by angels.
Although there was a genuine public outpouring of emotion, the bitter conflicts of the years following Waterloo hasn't been forgotten by one Republican. On a November day here in Marlow, Shelley heard about the death at Claremont. It inspired him to write a political pamphlet. He called it an address to the nation on the death of Princess Charlotte. But this wasn't to be a simple eulogy. The pamphlet also mourned the death of three men who were executed on the day following Princess Charlotte's death. These three were workers from Derbyshire. They'd been involved in a protest march calling for reform, but they'd been set up to it by a government spy. Shelley was one of the few radicals to risk open publication of his views. Liberty is dead, he wrote. Fetters heavier than iron weigh upon us, because they bind our souls. The government seemed to have no answer to the pressure for democratic change that was coming from below. The morning of the 19th of August, 1819, was hot and cloudless. On that morning, a cloth worker called John Lees left his home in Oldham. He wanted to go into Manchester to attend a big rally for parliamentary reform that was being held in St. Peter's Fields. He and 60,000 other people wanted to hear the famous orator Henry Hunt. Orator Hunt, the champion of Spa Fields, was perhaps the best man in Britain to inspire and lead large crowds in the call for greater freedom. At half past one, Henry Orator Hunt arrived at this spot and he climbed up onto a cart to address the crowd. So he would have seen 60,000 people watching him, all crammed into this area that's about the size of two football pitches. But it was quiet. These people were unarmed, they were sober, they were behaving very well and they'd come dressed in their Sunday best. So Orator Hunt is all ready to go with his speech. But the local magistrates are watching from a house just over there and they just can't believe that his speech is going to go off peacefully. And they panic. They send in the special constables and the local militia called the Yeomanry to arrest Orissa Hunt. The crowd try to protect him by linking their arms, but the Yeomanry, they're only volunteers, they start waving their sabres around. They're clearly out of their depth. So the proper soldiers are called in. Two bands of hussars are summoned and they're ordered to clear the square. This is Cheatham's Library in Manchester. It was founded in 1653 and it's the oldest public library in Britain. It was well known to the radicals of Regency Manchester and lots of their original documents still survive here. I've come to look at the contemporary evidence with the historian Robert Poole to find out how a peaceful protest turned into a bloody massacre. So what kind of a man was he, Henry Hunt? He was called Orator Hunt as well, wasn't he? Because he had enormous lungs. Yes, Hunt was also a powerful personality. He said, I'm a gentleman farmer with a small fortune mm -hmm. and a friend of the people. And he contrasted himself to the wealthy parasites who, who ran government and finance at the time, the equivalent of the, the fat cat bankers of our own age. Yeah. He saw himself as one of the wealth producers, but also as a kind of aristocratic leader of the people. But he became outraged about the way that the people were treated and had fallen in with the radical Whigs. So he wasn't of the people, he wasn't a weaver, but he'd set himself up as their leader. And on one level, he's giving them good advice here, isn't he? He's saying, behave well, don't get drunk, behave in an orderly fashion and we'll be fine. But mm. at the same time, he's kind of hinting that there could be trouble. He's talking about our enemies and there might be bloodshed and he calls the authorities malignant and contemptible. Yes, and, and accuses the authorities of seeking, a, seeking to excite a riot in order to have a pretense for spilling blood. Hunt was extremely good at almost riding two horses at once. He needed to rouse the people and demonstrate the tremendous force of popular resentment, but at the same time demonstrate that only he could control crowds. What did he want exactly in calling all of his associates to this meeting? What did they hope to achieve together? They wanted a radical reform of Parliament, that is universal suffrage, by which they meant manhood 
suffrage, annual parliaments so that MPs regularly had to account for themselves, and a secret ballot to make sure that people couldn't be influenced by their landlords or employers. And part of the problem was that Manchester, this great industrial city, it wasn't really represented, was it? Because the old distribution of MPs didn't take it into account. No, Manchester was a, a modern industrial city in many ways, but it was just a kind of had parish pump politics. It was governed by its, its parish vestry and its court leet and a lot of constables and dog whippers and so forth. Um, it wasn't a modern town at all. And this is a plan of the setup at St Peter's Field. Yes, on the print you can see the density of people in the middle, all the flags, the banners and so on around the hustings, but also towards the edges, quite a large number of spectators. Um, it was not just a, a rally of reform. As the, it was a bit of a day out and there were a lot of people there watching as well, mm -hmm. which makes what happened next all the more shocking. And they sent in the deputy constable to arrest Henry Hunt simply because they feared that anybody making a rousing speech to a large crowd of ordinary people gathered without a legitimate authority to keep them in order, that that was like applying a match to a dry field. They just felt that there had to be some kind of explosion. So the yeomanry panicked. They came in, they started slashing people and it was said that they were drunk. Is that true? Well, if they hadn't been drinking at lunchtime, it would have been very out of character for the Manchester Yeomanry. A lot of them were publicans and small tradesmen and that's what people did at lunchtime. There, there were well-attested reports of that and of the fact that they had their, their swords sharpened in the, in the weeks before as well. And when they got stuck, they were untrained. They were volunteers. They'd only been formed a couple of years before. And they started slashing around them with sabres, which caused a tremendous crush and a panic and sparked off what became known as the Peterloo Massacre. This book here is a list of all, well, many of the people who did get hurt. And here we've got Judith Kilner, a pregnant woman, was much bruised. And here we've got a lady thrown into a cellar with a woman who was killed, was pregnant at the time. Here we've got somebody cut under the ear by a sabre. We've got people being sabred and crushed, being hit on the head with truncheons, being crushed by the horses. Mm. Ooh, it's just horrible. How many people actually got killed? Uh, there were 15 killed on the day, uh, but there were over 650 injured in only 20 minutes, which is why it deserves the title, I think, of a massacre. And uh, over 200 of those were sabre wounds, many of those were women, and some of them were children. And there's some research been done on the injuries to women at Peterloo, and it's, it's fairly reliably reckoned that they were more likely to be sabred than the men. The yeomanry went for the women because they were the people that the authorities hated and resented most. That's because it was felt it was improper for women to be taking part in politics. Yes, female reformers dressed in virginal white in that patriotic way simply seemed to the authorities uh, like Marianne, the symbol of the French Revolution. It was claimed they were deaf to, to, to every feminine virtue. And you can see this in this satirical um, picture. Um, from a loyalist newspaper here. You've got a, an imaginary scene at, a, at one of the meetings of female reformers in Manchester. Meetings of this kind did happen. But you can see here, these female reformers have no idea how to conduct a meeting. One of them is standing on the table. Many of them are drinking gin. None of them are listening. And there's one of them here that's snogging. They're all chattering. They don't know anything about politics. And it's reminiscent of these sort of 17th century pictures of the fox addressing the silly geese who think they know about politics but really don't. And just like a proper of battle, there were all sorts of souvenirs and medals made, weren't there? Planned with satirical intent. And there's an example here which is modelled on the famous Josiah Wedgwood anti-slavery medal, the black slave kneeling, and the, the slogan, am I not a man and brother? Well here the kneeling figure is, is, is a ragged weaver, and he's saying, am I not a man and brother? And he's speaking to a member of the yeomanry who has a bloodied axe raised and the reply is, no, you're a poor weaver. Off with your head. Mm. And it's surrounded by skulls and crossbones too. Mm. It's a very... Ooh, mm. it's, it's bitter, isn't it? It's making the point that Britain has abolished slavery abroad. But um, they're still doing it, it at home. It, yes. Yeah. How quickly was that connection made, Waterloo? This became known as Peterloo in sort of parody. Very quickly. Well, in a way, it was the authorities who made the connection first because one of the volunteer special constables said um, to some of the crowd, this is Waterloo for you, meaning, you know, like Napoleon, you reformers have now met your Waterloo. Um, the constables and the yeomen were very proud of what they were doing in averting revolution as they saw it. And within a week, 
uh, the local radical newspaper, the Manchester Observer, had announced that it was going to publish all the evidence under the title of Peterloo Massacre, with ironic reference to Waterloo. This was the time when the troops um, who were supposed to be guarding the people had in fact turned on them, and there were far more Waterloo veterans amongst the crowd than there were amongst the troops. of shoemakers, a coffee house owner, a failed law student from Jamaica, and this rather mysterious character, George Edwards, who was probably a government agent inciting the whole thing. Now, this caused real problems when it came to the trial. Would the case collapse because of the presence of the government agent? Well, no, it didn't, because this conspirator, John Monument, he turned evidence against his colleagues. So they were all condemned. John Monument was let off for being a snitch. George Edwards was let off for being a government agent. But the rest of them were all executed. Just at the point that the Prince Regent was about to become King George IV, it looks like Britain was just on the brink of revolution. George continued his life of idleness and excess. Yet he and his government would next face an opponent far more destructive than either Hunt or Thistlewood. The opposition will come now in the form of his estranged and reviled wife, the now Queen Caroline. In the country, Caroline was seen as the wronged and abused wife. All the more so when George tried, unsuccessfully, to divorce her by act of parliament. His pretext was her rumoured scandalous behaviour. Caroline had got a bit too close to her Italian servant, Bartolomeo Pergami. They'd been seen kissing. They'd even been seen undressed together, and there was talk about an illegitimate child. The bill got through the House of Lords, but Caroline was so amazingly popular in the country, it seemed really unlikely it would get through the House of Commons. So George had to give up. He couldn't stop her from becoming queen. All he could hope was that she wouldn't show up at his coronation. Despite the distraction of a wild and unwanted queen, George started to plan the most extravagant, the most expensive coronation of all time. At Kensington Palace, where I work as a curator, we look after the enormous coronation robe that George chose for the moment he truly became king. On three, okay. One, two, three. He may have been king of a divided nation, but George always knew how to put on a good show. So you lift first off the table, and then one, two, three, up. Slowly, slowly. Well done, it's going through. Okay, let's go. Nearly there. Here it is, come on, let's open it up. Okay. Because of its fragile condition, this robe rarely sees the light of day. And this is my first full chance to see it unwrapped. Okay. One, two, 
Okay. So this is George the Fourth's coronation robe from his coronation in 1821. The whole event got delayed a year because they needed the extra planning time to make it into this huge extravaganza. Look how richly it's embroidered with all this gold and all these sequins. And this was purple imperial velvet. He's trying to out Napoleon Napoleon here. This is actually the one he wore to come out at the end. When he arrived at the coronation, he was wearing a red velvet robe, very similar. He spent £24,000 on these robes, and it needed nine people to carry it for him. He turned up in this huge, magnificent procession that seemed to go on for miles. It was led by the herb women, strewing herbs for the king to walk over. He appeared with his robe bearers, and then all the peerage turned up, and George had insisted that the peers, many of whom were elderly men, dress up in these Tudor outfits wearing tights. The peers were a bit dubious about this, and it is true there were sniggers from their wives when they arrived in the Abbey. But this was the greatest show on earth. George commissioned a special new crown for himself. He hired 12,000 diamonds. It was a five-hour ceremony. At several points, he was seen to be sweating. He almost fainted. He had to be revived with smelling salts. But he kept up his spirits. Everybody also noticed that he was nodding and winking to his mistress, who was in the audience. But it definitely left an indelible mark on the memories of everybody who was there. So five hours later, this is the robe in which he made his first appearance as the crowned anointed king. But however meticulously George had planned his own anointing as king, there was still one unresolved problem. Caroline. And she wasn't a woman to take no for an answer. This is pretty much the only view of the coronation enjoyed by George's wife, Caroline. She'd been exiled from court at the start of the Regency, and she'd gone overseas. But when he became king, she turned back up again, wanting to be crowned. This is despite the fact that she'd been offered £50,000 to stay away. So, on coronation day, she arrived at Westminster Abbey and she flew at the doors, shouting, I am the Queen! Open! I am the Queen of Britain! Let me pass! But the doors remained closed. The coronation was the Prince Regent's final bow. Now the Regency was officially over. It had been a splendid ten years for architecture, for poetry, for painting and for prose. But it had also been ten years of waste and profligacy and royal immorality. Britain may have won the Battle of Waterloo, but it looked like the country was at war with itself. Was there ever a decade of greater contrasts? I don't think so. And what about George IV as king? How would he be remembered? Well, 200 years later, English Heritage ran a poll and he was voted Britain's worst monarch ever. So the Regency for me is two things, untold elegance combined with...